Father, we just lift up your daughter, Reverend Michelle. And Lord, we just pray for fresh anointing once more this morning. Lord, we just ask you to, to surround her with your consuming fire. Give her strength in her body. Um, give, soothe her voice, Lord, so that she could bring your, your message, Lord. And that through her, we would hear your heart, Lord. And we just pray for our own hearts and minds and eyes to be open so that we could hear truth and 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 just accept the truth and act on the truth, Lord. Act in, to, and love you more and love each other more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 In Jesus' mighty name, Father, I thank you for the privilege, O oh God, of sharing your word with your people. And Lord, I ask that your word will be deposited in their heart. God, the enemy cannot come and steal it. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you, O oh God. Amen and amen. And it's going to leave you wanting more, but that's okay. We've said we have been studying the book of Philippians. So you can go back and listen to the previous uploads. It's only four chapters. I encourage you to, to do this. But we are going to zero in on chapter 2, verses 12 to 18. And I want to say to you, as we begin to study it, we understand how important community is. How important the love of God and the love for each other is. As Paul goes to pains to point this out. So something we would normally do in the other services, welcome you. Because of time, we've tried to cut short a lot of things. But you know what, Rev? We can't cut this out. Because we've got to make time, no matter what. We want to welcome those who are new and have just come. And I know they're embarrassed, they don't want to stand up. But if you know that you've not seen this face, please make it a point to give them a little elbow and thing when they're leaving. You understand? It's very difficult to come in and have to leave straight away. And if there are any faces that you haven't seen for a while, welcome as well, please. Praise God. So, we have here chapter 2. And I just want to read this to you from verses 12 to 18. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his great pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me. You know, as we were singing that song, worshipping with it, joy to the world. Some people feel that the only time something like that is sung is this time of the year. But that's not so. Every single word that we sang earlier came from the word of God. Because the word tells us, Paul says it, I joy and rejoice with you all. Paul was in prison as he wrote these words under the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you go back and listen to some of the previous messages dealing with this topic, you will understand that in the midst of a great trial, he was an encourager. 
and we are called in the midst of our own challenges right now to not forget to encourage each other if you want the joy of the Lord to be your strength you don't wait for somebody to come and reach out to you in the midst of your trial you find someone to give an encouraging word in the midst of your offense you reach out to someone no one should be left alone and while Paul is here imploring the Philippian church in the ways that he has as we had started to study it in the many ways he continues to point the people to community to loving to encouraging because as we will find is not what people say or do to us good or bad what matters is what we say and do to people and may I say good or bad both have consequences and without being able to go and explain it again this is pointing to humility in Paul we spoke about the humility of Christ but here we are looking at this is humility sometimes we think humility is something else and I can't rehash where we went in the last couple of weeks but we need to understand that we need to look at people like Paul serve God in humility and serve his people in humility and follow the example in living life the saved life day by day so we see here in verse 12 wherefore my beloved as you have always obeyed not as in my presence only but now much more in my absence work out your own salvation with fear and trembling here we see Paul saying not because I'm around you you put on the show of showing love don't obey just because I'm with you you gotta obey when I'm not with you now much more in my absence because the tendency was that the church would obey when Paul would come and when he would turn his back it would be something else he says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling and Paul you see he was an example of selfless humility and service and he conveyed the closeness of his relationship with the Philippians by referring to them as my beloved my dear friends and there are those pastors and leaders like Paul that that's how they feel so in fact that's the call and if the call of my dear friends my beloved is not there something is wrong because when God puts his love in your heart this is how you will view the brethren whether they view you like that or not is not going to matter it does not we have to stop looking at what people do or don't do we've got to ask God to let us be the change and even while you are saying that there are things God is working out in you but from the time and Paul is saying this from the time we just do it for a show this is not God's will it's performing rather than allowing God to work through us and so when he says here he commended their past obedience and urged them to work out your salvation with fear and trembling he did not say work for your salvation you're not working for your salvation you're working out your salvation and because we know that it is by grace that you have been saved the word says this 
in Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So, he's acknowledging we have been saved by grace, but when he says work out your salvation, to bring the salvation to completion, you've got to live out the fact that you are saved. The fruit of salvation must be there, else you're not saved. You know a tree by its fruit. So in working out your salvation, it's all the myriad of things that come against us. All the toes that get squeezed and the wounds that we receive and all the things that happen it starts working out your salvation our tendency is we want the same way our spirit man is instantly regenerated so our spirit man has been taken over by the holy spirit but that is not the area that needs perfecting it's the other areas our mind our emotions, our soul, our body. And those are the areas that can hijack our salvation. Because if you don't have your mind renewed, your mind could tell you all kinds of things that will cause you to leave that narrow road. If you don't learn to submit your emotions to the cross, your emotions can lead you to sin in a way that you find yourself stuck and you can't come out. Your emotions could cage you. And I'm saying this because that's the working out. That's the getting the discipling for those areas that are ruling us because the only way we have to be a slave is to Jesus Christ. And so when Paul talks to them, and he says, bring your salvation to completion, meaning work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Don't take it for granted. Well, I'm saved, so I reach. Because there's a working out with fear and trembling. Why fear and trembling? Because you are the true and living God. And God, I want nothing to cause me, to cause somebody to leave the narrow path, to give up on church. Or to leave because there are some things in me that just continue to cause me to do the same thing over and over till I feel to give up. And there are many in the body of Christ today that have not been taught that those areas in their minds have to be transformed, renewed, so that transformation will occur. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So they become saved. But their mind does not stop pumping out stuff that has been deposited by Satan. And as we are finding, week after week we are learning, God is showing us through the word how certain things that are in our minds, strongholds, can be broken. Shame, all these things that's causing us to behave in certain ways. There's a whole list. But I need us to understand that Paul never stopped encouraging them. In other words, whatever it takes, work out your salvation. You can't say because you're saved, it's okay. He would have said so. He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So if there are areas where I need help, then get the help. I want us to know. He says here in verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And this outcome is possible, not through human effort, but because God indwells you and is working in you. He indwells us, he's working in us. Christians must demonstrate that they are saved by allowing God to work through them. Now you could say, I'm saved and I don't care what people think. But that is totally contrary to the call of the church. You have to care. You have to care if 
someone is stumbling because you say you're saved, but your behavior shows otherwise. You must care if you say you are saved and maybe no one really knows the fruit because they're never, you're never wrong them. Because, you see, Paul is speaking to the church. Unless there be any pride, well, I prayed all these hours, I read the word, I do all of this, and so therefore, I'm good. He's saying, it's God who works in you. It's a work of the Spirit. Now, why is that also important? Because there are some things do not go just so. We can't perform it. Performing means I make up a list of things and I do it. I do this, that, the other, da, 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 da. To everybody else, it looks great. But the truth of the matter is, there's been no change on the inside. It's just a performance. And until you come to the point where you realize it is God, it's a work of the Spirit, it's a work of the Spirit. If change has not come, it's either we are not availing ourselves to be in his presence because many have said in his presence sometimes in the middle of praise express or in the middle of tarrying in his presence you say yes but i could be in his presence in my room yes you could but i hear i see here that paul speaks to a church paul is not speaking to an individual you need to get the context for these epistles the messages are to the church there will be some messages to individuals, but by and large, it's to the church. Which means there is a working out that takes place in church community. That we take back home. That we apply at home or work and we come back to receive. And in his presence, some yokes will break. And we have not done anything except say, God, I cannot change myself. I need you to change me. And being in his word, immersing ourselves in his word and obeying. So I want us to understand here that we have to surrender for the spirit of God to take over because we are, God is going to respect what we say if we don't want him to take over. He's not going to force himself. So Paul here is speaking of that faith that causes us to surrender our life. Sometimes we are wondering why things are happening the way they're happening. There's a surrendering we haven't done. Now, a lot of people, a lot of religious people, a lot of legalists, they make up a list that people who are saved should be looking like. So if you're not quite dressing the way you should, immediately you're given a speech. Now here's what I want to tell you. While it is important to speak the truth and love to people, there are those who have not fully been able to have that transformation where they look in the mirror and see what they have on is not suitable. And maybe we do need to say something, but with a new convert, or those who have been in church for 20 years but have not been saved and are only now saved, same thing, you will find there are some behaviors that they cannot understand what you are saying to them when you say to them something is wrong. And just what Jesus does, he journeys with you, you cannot force people, but I'm here to tell you I've never seen a person who really wants the Lord, that the Lord doesn't convict of sexual immorality the conviction will be there I cannot have sex anymore outside of marriage because there's something in me that riles up now that didn't happen before and they will come and tell you there's that conviction and you have not yet said anything to them it's a work of the spirit but not a work of the spirit where well I'm just going about my business and doing what I want the spirit of God will convict me when he's ready there are certain conditions here and Paul is saying, as you work out your salvation, that includes bringing, coming together corporately so that in his presence, 
where there is life, yokes will break. Yokes will break with you by yourself, but God did not ordain that that's the only way. And there are some people that say, and especially those who have never set foot in this church, but found Jesus in COVID and have only been online. There's been breakthrough in their life from simply taking part in whatever was being offered in the church. They've never come face to face with me because they can't. But God has set them free. It's a work of the Spirit. So a lot of the legalists and the religious people that find fault with people don't understand. All God requires of us is to take the plank out of our eyes through the power of his Holy Spirit. Stop bringing down other people. Pray for them. Love them. If you have a relationship with them, say to them, you know, if I were, if I were you, I would consider X, Y, and Z. Hush and pray. Because it is only the Spirit of God that can bring conviction. I want us to know that leads straight on to verse 14. Because you see, as Christians mature and allow God to work through their lives. Notice I say mature. There are mature Christians and there are immature Christians. They will find that God is accomplishing his purpose in them even when they're not aware of it. That's maturity. If it is left to us, okay, Lord, fix this in me, fix that in me. Fix. Listen to me. When you decide it's only him and you love him and you love his people, don't leave his people out. You can't love God who's the spirit and not love the fellow man. God's people are very precious to God. Very precious. The, the brethren that irritate you, they're precious to God. Be careful what you say about them. I want us to know God will work in us and we don't even know he's working. And then all of a sudden you'll be like, that thing I used to do, I don't feel to do anymore. You see, so the word says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Verse 14. Now, the reason why we are teaching this way at this point, it wouldn't be so all the time, is because we love a lot of topical messages. This is the topic, we pull the scripture and that's fine. But when you have to take your Bible and read it and understand what it's saying, His word, more than anything else, will act as a sword. So by the time we finish, we are supposed to understand what the book of Philippians is about. I want you to know, when you allow God to work in you, you will do everything without complaining or arguing. The reason we complain and argue is because we've not yet been able to allow God to work in us. You see, when God works in us, when God works in us, there is a Love he puts in our heart. It mightn't happen straight away. Only because sometimes the surrender is not there. Or our understanding of how God works may not be there. When God works in us, he puts a love in our heart for the fellow brothers and sisters. That when you are asked to do something by the very person you can't stand, but you love, you have to love, you will do it. You will not argue. You will not complain. Since if that were not so, it would not be in the Bible. If somebody said it, you will say that can't be so. It's in the Bible. Paul is saying, do everything without complaining or arguing. You see, unsafe people might be expected to complain and dispute. And this is where we are leading people astray because the unsaved are watching. Oh, do they watch the social media when the fights start among the Christians. I've had people tell me the reason they took so long to come to the Lord is because of the behavior of Christians around them. 
the last years. It's very, very sad. But our life is not sad. It's sad when we don't realize we are not our own saints. A price was paid for us. We are called to be lights in this world the way God says to be, not the way we want to be. So Christians are to have changed lives. And you say, well, that's not fear. God is still working in me. Yes, he is. And that's why you're learning this. So after today, you've got the question, the complaining and the arguing and the bickering. You then will say, okay, now I know. This is not what I've called to do or to be. Father, work in me. Please, God, do what you have to do. When you begin to let God look at you, we take our eyes off of others. We will be saying, God, please help me. And not God, please help them. Because as God helps us, he will use us to influence them. And we will do the work of God without being negative or rebellious. And the finger pointing and the, you know, if it were me, I could do it this way. And listen to me, if it were you and you could do it that way, you don't need a savior. In fact, you never needed a savior. Because there was a time when you wasn't doing it that way. And somebody prayed for you and the Holy Spirit moved in you. You were not always as perfect as you are now. But if we truly know the word of God, our righteousness is like menstrual cloths because that's what the Greek, that's what the word says. I know we like to read it. Filthy rags. That's what the filthy rags is. That's what God is saying in the word, y'all. Anything we think is good about us is like menstrual pads. I'm spelling it out because sometimes we are like so spiritual. We don't understand. In other words, the holiness of God. And us, oh, he loves us. But please, if you want God to help, you've got to know exactly where you're at. God spelled it out for us. So this verse says, 15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. How do we shine? How do we live out this ongoing moral example of reflecting the image and likeness of God? Because we grasp all of the gospel. We need to understand that at the end of the day, God is changing us more and more into his image and likeness we are called to stand blameless and harmless this is where we are going without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation it's getting more and more crooked is the darkness around us and the church what's happening is you have the apostate church and you have the remnant church and I'm saying this to say the church at large is being shaken because more perversity is coming into the church. And at the end of the day, I need us to understand that Paul is looking forward to witnessing the progress that these Christians will make in their lives. They are the reason for his ministry. He wants a concluding scene of history because he knows he doesn't have that long again to show that his life had had meaning. This is how they were birthed. This is what they were birthed on. And as he stands at the final judgment to hear God's evaluation of his life, he wants to hear that the Philippians have been the stars in the universe. And I need us to understand, each of us, we will give an account. And the excuse cannot be, well, you know, it's because this one did that and that one. It has to be, we walk circumspect. 
We be sold out. We love people. We stand with them. And by the transformation that God does in us, others will be influenced. And even if they are not, we still stand. And we disarm everything that comes our way with love. You see, if anyone had any reason to complain, and Paul talks about it. I'm going to read the last two verses and sum this whole thing up. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Paul is saying, I don't want to labor in vain. A lot of us forget. We know what the word is saying, but Paul here as their pastor, his heart is being poured out. I don't want to know I've labored in vain. A lot of us, our definition of a pastor has been defined from what the world has said or what pastors who don't know the word have defined themselves. But pastors grieve. Pastors answer to God. Whether a person chooses to listen to the pastor or not, God will hold that pastor accountable for that person in the way their life is. And he says here, Yea, and if I be offered up upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and I rejoice with you all. So I want to say this. If anyone had the right to complain, Paul did. Yet he was an example of what he preached. He was facing possible death in prison. And he viewed it simply as an act of worship. A drink offering to God. We are called to pour ourselves out as a drink offering unto God. The only reason we may not is because we've put boundaries in as to how much we are prepared to go and to give sacrificially. We have put the boundaries in. But you don't hear Paul talking here about boundaries. Such a liquid offering would be poured out on the altar of God's heart. Paul did not describe his work and suffering as that means sacrifice. The ministry of the Philippian church, he is saying, constituted that sacrifice. His ministry, he's saying, merely supplemented and completing theirs. And seeing their faith in action brings joy. That's why the word says, don't cause grief to those who watch over your soul. Yes, there are those God has appointed, regardless of what has been preached out there. There are roles that God has placed each person in. And pastor's roles are to watch over souls. And when we don't want any input, we are literally going against what God has called them to do. And their grief deepens because at the end of the day, Paul says when he sees their faith in action, he's joyful. So grief will come and it comes when in some cases you're not even allowed to see you can't contact, you can't talk to, because the wall is up. Thus far, no further. This is my life. You have no right to pour anything into it. That's the religious church that has raised many Christians. They've come out of religion. This is not the church of Jesus Christ. And I want to say here that Paul encourages his readers to have the same attitude and rejoice with him. You must have the same attitude with those you are discipling. When you say you want to disciple somebody, you make up your schedule. This is the time I'm giving them. After that is no other time. Don't disciple. Please don't. Please don't. Because the way we are called to disciple doesn't mean you have no private time. But quite frankly, you are in the trench with that person. That's the early church's definition. Now, Around your family life, many things can be done. But what we have done is we put boundaries in. But you ought to be disturbed if somebody you are discipling begins to stray. You ought to not be able to sleep. You ought to be up praying because it bothers you so much. This is how Paul is calling the Philippian church. And I want to say, as I close... While I did not get to speak about the humility of other servants that were there, Ephrod, Epaphroditus and so, we have looked at Paul. And 
I want us to understand that sacrificial love is the call. And I said this last week and I'm going to say it again. We need other people because we are created as social beings. God did not make man to be alone. Now, I'm not saying you need people in an idolatrous way, but please, save the speech that you don't need anyone. You are in deception. You feel better that way, but that does not make it truth. I need us to understand that we must have relationships, interaction, and contact with others. That's why the agenda of Satan with this COVID is totally passing through children, their lives, families, the church, because this is the opposite of what Christianity is. No contact with people. Can't spend time talking. Can't hug. Can't, do you understand what I'm saying? But I want us to know that God has established humanity so that we cannot have good relationships without treating others well. When I treat you well, I treat me well. And we both get our needs met in a context of love and unity. When I treat you poorly, you treat me, and you treat me poorly. We are each isolated and unhappy. When Christ asked me to regard another person as more important than myself, and we spoke about this last week, what he wants is to give me a deep, satisfying relationship with others. When we consider the needs of others above ourselves, there is a depth of relationship that God is calling us to that we have not understood because that's not how the world thinks. The harm he wants to keep us from is the barrenness of isolation and the emptiness of what loving like Jesus loves Cold love. He wants to keep us from cold love. So, I want to, to just simply close, and I just want to ask Mr. Larry to pray at the end here as we close. I want to say this. God calls us to love and serve others. Sacrificial love is the result of God working in us. It's here in, the, in, in, in Philippians. Sacrificial. So if you can't sacrificially love, there's more work that God wants to do in you. You will shine like a star when you look out for the needs of others. So if we're planning a service, it will not be about on the paper and the list. It will be about what do the people need. It will be about how can I help someone in the service. Do you understand what I'm saying? Same thing with your families. But I'm, I'm trying for us to understand it's always going to be about the other person. And when you look out for the interests of others, you look out for the interests of Christ. So I just want to leave you here because we are going on to another service. But hold on. Don't just race out. I want Minister Larry to just come and pray that this word, saints, go back to, to Philippians 2. We've been on Philippians 1. We're going to go on to another chapter for the next service. These are the things that must be embedded in our soul and not have just a knowledge of I'm a Christian. What does God say about how he calls us? Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Since we have just a few minutes, thank you all. Um, can we come in agreement with prayer? Can we please uh, stand before we... Let's focus. Father, we give you praise and we give you all honor. We give you all the glory. Most high God, Adonai, we exalt your holy, holy name, O oh Lord. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, that as we have come here, Lord God, as your people, called by your name, Father, for those who know you, Lord God, Father, for those who are saved through the blood of the Lamb, Father, that you are speaking to us through your vessel and through your word. You've spoken today, Lord God. Father, we pray, I pray, Lord God, Father, that each heart here and each soul, Lord God, will receive the things which you have meant 
to deposit by the power of your word, Lord God, Father, that not one of your word will return to you void from any heart here or any soul here, Lord God, that they will leave here not being the same, Lord God, Father, that the transforming power of your word will bring to life, O oh Lord, my God, every area of our heart yes, Lord. and soul and spirit, Lord God, Father. I pray, Lord God, that, that your word will be sunk deep in our hearts, Lord God, Father, that it will not escape us, Lord God, Father. Bind it to our hearts with your seal of love, with your seal of the blood of the Lamb, that it will not escape us, though we may run from it, Lord God, Father. Let not your word escape from us, Lord God. Let it be hidden in our inward parts. Father, help us to answer the call after our master. He has laid down his life, Yeshua, before us, Lord God. He came, he laid down his life for us on the cross, and he called us to follow him. Father, as we follow the master, help us to work out our salvation, Lord God, with fear and with trembling that we will take heed to this word, which is your word, that we will take heed in our spirit, in our mind, in our soul, in our attitudes, in our behaviors. Father, that we will reflect, Lord God, Father, in the mirror of your word. And Father, let your heart be revealed in all of us. In Jesus' name, bring us to that place of total surrender. In the name of Jesus. Father, our cry is, Help us in Help Jesus' us, name. We bless you and we thank you. Amen. No.